What's up everyone? In this episode of Motive Garage presented by Sparesbox, we are comparing and testing the factory six throttles versus drive-by-wire single throttle for the RB engine. Well, this is probably the most anticipated test we've ever done with our GTR, both for you guys and for us. I've always wanted to do this test, but I'm gonna be brutally honest. I didn't wanna do this test until we made over a thousand horsepower because based on everything I'd learned over the last 20 years with GDRs, my attitude was don't bother going to a big single throttle uh, inlet manifold until you make over a thousand horsepower. But how true is that? Well, that's what we're gonna find out because I've heard every rumor there is about six throttle versus single throttle. Everything from single throttle will lose bottom end and mid range. Uh, the six throttle is more responsive. I've heard every claim there is which one's right, which one's wrong? Well, that's what I want to find out firsthand with some good old scientific, thorough, motive video style testing. But first up, let's look at the pros and cons of individual throttle bodies versus one big single throttle. So the first main advantage of individual throttles is response. Obviously, all of the naturally aspirated race engines you see out there, such as supercars and all that sort of stuff, they all use individual throttles. They're more responsive, they've got better control, but the main thing for naturally aspirated cars is they can tune the length of that inlet runner to vary their power curve, so mid-range or top-end power. Now, with a turbo car, there is some other advantages that exist by having individual throttles, and the main one is the distance between where the throttle is to the actual inlet valve of the engine. And I'll explain that very quickly. So if you're on part throttle, about to come out of a corner, you're already building some boost. So all of the intercooler and the piping are all filled up with boost, but the throttles are, are partly closed, which means you don't have boost in the actual engine. The whole idea is when you then open the throttle, the amount of volume that needs to fill up is only the distance from the throttle plate uh, to the actual head. There's not a lot of volume to fill up, so the engine gets on to boost very quickly and you get that more responsive feel. Well, when you have a big single throttle like this, you need to fill up this entire plenum before it then gets into the engine once you get that throttle open. So that's probably the biggest advantage with six throttle. Highly complicated linkages and springs. Um, you've got to tune a little bit differently to what you do when you've got single throttle. You tune against TPS more than anything else because it's hard to get a good vacuum source. Uh, and obviously the cost. Converting over to individual throttles is usually really expensive. Obviously the GTR has it from factory. Single throttle, simple tuning. One throttle, plenty of vacuum in here and, and uh, boost source to, to draw from. So you can basically tune it very easily. It's neater, especially with drive-by wire. Uh, packaging, so it's easier to package, it's easier to shape the inlet manifold, put the throttle board where you want. And obviously there's the price involved. Now, this is more price I'm talking from OEM manufacturers to do it in the first place, not so much the price of what it costs to convert in a GTR, because obviously this is some pretty big dollar items you can get for your GTR. Um, but let's, let's have a little look at comparing the two. So we talked about runner length between six throttle uh, and single throttle. If we have a look at the runner length on the six throttle, where you basically get the base plate, the throttle plate, and then take a look at the runner. But in our instance, we actually used the length of the Hypertune inlet, because that's what we have on our GTR at the moment. The runner length is 127 millimeters. If we have a look at this V2 inlet manifold from Hypertune and look at the runner length here, the runner length for that, 120 millimeters. So not a massive amount of difference in runner length. And the only reason we want to talk about runner length is basically once the throttles are fully open on the six throttle, or in this case, just open, that runner length, I, I guess, is part of controlling the power curve and things like that. Um, and also that runner length has a lot to do with how it behaves off boost as well. Um, the volume of the plenum for the Hypertune six throttle and both the uh, single throttle obviously is much larger than factory. And what that will do obviously is when you stand on the throttle, as well as filling up all the piping and intercooler, you need to fill up uh, the plenum chamber as well. So it takes longer to fill it up if it's larger. But for us, we're gonna be comparing single throttle versus six throttle using a Hypertune inlet. And we're actually gonna be using a V1 inlet manifold. So we're still gonna use this factory base plate um, and then have the V1 go over the top as opposed to a V2, which replaces all of the runners. So um, our one has been port matched um, to match the head and to match the inlet manifold. And obviously it was port matched 
uh, the same when we had the six throttles. So we basically have the most optimized six throttle solution you can get. Uh, and then obviously it's all port matched correctly for our GTR. So before we talk about my predictions with the car, let's take a look at some rough numbers of flow. We're not gonna get into actual flow rates, just quickly looking at some surface area of the opening. So with the six throttle, uh, they're 4.5 centimeters when measured in diameter, uh, which means they've got 15.9 centimeters squared of total surface area. Obviously you then have a throttle shaft in the middle, um, which takes up 4.5 centimeters squared. So now we're talking a total of 11.4 uh, square centimeters of surface area. Times that by six, 68.4 square centimeters is the total surface area between all six. Why is surface area important? Well, I guess that's how much space the air can flow through. But then you have the actual inlet itself or the opening into the actual, into the plenum chamber. And that measures at 7.5 centimetres, 75 millimetres, so that's 44.1 square centimetres. Now, obviously when you've got boost, air is getting forced in there, so the overall surface area or diameter isn't as important as naturally aspirated cars, but just remember, the throttles have all of this room, but the plenum still only has an opening this big. So that's one thing you need to consider when comparing the flow rates of each one. If you go over to single throttle, we have an 82 millimetre drive-by-wire Bosch throttle body, um, and the surface area is 52.8 square centimetres minus the plate in the middle, 43.6 square centimetres. So if you compare the smallest opening on the factory or the Hypertune six throttle, 44 square centimetres up against 43.6 square centimetres. And then obviously the throttles themselves have 68.4 square centimetres. So in terms of the actual amount of, I guess, area that can, air can flow through between them. No real difference in the throttle body size versus the actual inlet into the plenum, but obviously the throttle plates themselves have plenty of flow. So if you look at that, you'd say to yourself, is there really gonna be any more flow or power to be had with the single throttle versus the six throttle? I don't know. Um, the turbulence, the actual flow through each runner, there could be some difference in outright power. Uh, my biggest prediction though will be the difference in drivability. And that is simply due to the fact that with the six throttles, the actual throttle itself is only about 70 millimeters from the head. Um, so when you get onto the throttle, obviously there's not a lot of volume to fill up, gets on boost quickly, really snappy and responsive to drive. Are we gonna lose that snappiness by going to a single throttle? Um, that's what we're gonna find out soon. Now the big thing by going electronic throttle body is it gives you a lot more strategies and control within your ECU. And what I mean by that is, rather than have say an ignition cut or staged ignition cut over time, you can actually slowly close the throttle body past a certain RPM, so the power just completely rolls over. So rather than hitting against a hard rev limiter and risking breaking the valve train or oil pump or anything else like that, by closing the throttle body slowly, essentially power just, well, it just falls over and the car won't rev anymore. So you can have a much safer rev limiter using an electronic throttle. Um, obviously launch control can be done quite differently. Instead of popping and banging off the rev limiter, you can use the electronic throttle to better control your launch control strategies. All of the tuning that you can do with drive-by wire plus cruise control plus being much neater, there are so many advantages to going to drive-by wire um, in this instance. It is also available on six throttle. So all of those advantages for drive-by wire can be had with single or six throttle. This test is all about comparing the factory six throttle system over to a single throttle drive-by wire and whether you should or shouldn't switch over or when you should switch over is probably going to be the answer that we look at. Um, IEE in New Zealand, Daytona Racing in Australia both offer a drive-by wire six throttle and we will be trying one of those out within large throttle bodies in a later test. But right now, I think it's time we get into it. We need to remove our six throttle setup, get on our Hypertune V1 setup and get testing. But there is a few little things we need to take care of to make it all work. Let's go. For our single throttle setup, we chose a Hypertune V1 inlet manifold with a Bosch Motorsport 82 millimeter drive-by-wire throttle body. You can see the new inlet side-by-side side with the Hypertune six throttle plenum 
that the tanks they use are the same, so the volume is the same on both. The Hypertune V1 inlet uses the factory base of the inlet, which contains water lines and the radiator outlet pipe, making it easier to install than the V2. We had the base port matched on both sides as well to ensure smooth airflow all the way from the bell mouths to the head. The runner length is the same as the V2 as well, so the results would be the same. We decided to modify our inlet base by removing the water and air balance tube and welding AN fittings onto the water outlets from the head to go into a header tank. This is an old school GTR modification for better cooling through the head. The other thing we needed for conversion to drive-by wire was an electronic throttle pedal. We used one from IEE in New Zealand. The factory pedal bolts onto this bracket and sensor so it all looks stock and bolts up to the factory holes, making it a great bolt-in solution. We also got a bunch of fittings from Raceworks that we needed for under the inlet manifold. The first step was to get the inlet manifold installed. Rob Arbolino from Cranked Motorsport came by to give us a hand. With the inlet manifold on, there was still a lot of work to do, so the car was tow trucked over to Croydon Racing Developments. The inlet manifold requires a new intercooler pipe to be fabricated. We took this opportunity to fabricate a new pipe from the intercooler to the throttle body, ditch the twin blow off valves and install a new turbo smart blow off valve. We used Hypertune clamps on the intercooler pipe in the engine bay and installed the TurboSmart blower valve behind the front bumper. Another reason for this blower valve change was to give us more room for a vacuum pump required with large camshafts and a single throttle body to have enough vacuum for the brake booster and because we wanted to move the fuse box from the engine bay to behind the bumper. GTR snowball effect engaged. The location of the throttle body and modified water outlets on the inlet runner also continued the snowball effect. The throttle body fouled against the radiator pipe and or the catch can, so CRD fabricated a new catch can for us with return to sump, made easier by the moving of the fuse box. The radiator had the filler neck cut off and a new top pipe welded on with a new rubber hose to clear the throttle body. We got a Hypertune header tank which fits in the back corner of the engine bay and I got into making some water lines thanks to Raceworks. Another change we made to the GTR at the same time was the fitment of TurboSmart's new FPR10 Pro 5 port fuel pressure regulator, which is designed for use with mechanical fuel pumps. It required a new bracket to fit and just a slight adjustment of the fuel lines. We also purchased some Injector Dynamics ID 2600 XDS injectors from Precision Racing, dealers for Injector Dynamics. We purchased these to give us more headroom for power in the future, but also because they are designed specifically for use with ethanol and methanol fuels, unlike our existing injectors, which require regular servicing. These required new plugs, and we had a new fast response air temp sensor from PRP, so we decided to completely rewire the cold side intake loom, which also tidied up our old and crummy wiring. These changes won't affect the results of the test. CID also had to wire up the IEE electronic pedal and the Bosch drive-by-wire throttle to the Howtech Elite 2500 before setting it all up. We did a few other things to the car at the same time, but we'll be covering these in a separate video.
With the car running again, it was on to the dyno for tuning. Switching over to single throttle means the tuning method is completely different, although much simpler, so essentially an entirely new tuner is required for the car. Con is a GTR guru, so it didn't take too long for us to get into the power runs. First up, on wastegate pressure. Our first run on wastegate pressure and we were already up 20 kilowatts or 27 horsepower. Looking firstly at the boost graph, you can see the latest test has a bit more boost to start with and a little bit less boost in the mid-range. So this affects the power curve, making it look like we have more bottom end and less mid-range, but really, we don't. If boost was identical, it would be pretty much the same power. What you can see is up top, the new single throttle hypertune inlet makes more power and starts to pull away more up top. Time to put in some boost and make some real power. We ended up making 1,098 horsepower, still with the air filter on and exhaust valve closed on a little over 32 PSI. This is basically the same power we used to make with the air filter off and flapper valve open, but on a pound less boost, proving the new engine combination is more efficient. We did the most logical thing though, and thought we would pull the air filter off and open up the AES flapper valve. We finally cracked 1100 horsepower, just, but we now did it on 32 PSI instead of 33 PSI. Showing at this power and efficiency level, the air filter and 4 inch exhaust work pretty well. But the small 101 twin scroll rear housing is starting to run out of efficiency past 1100, and we don't want to push it for the sake of it. These tests are better done with the turbo working well within its efficiency range. We then put the air filter back on, close the AES exhaust flapper valve, and put the boost back to between 30 and 31 PSI. We now have runs from the six throttle setup and single throttle setup on the same boost for back-to-back -back comparison. Looking at the boost curve, you can see the single throttle starts with more boost, so the first part of the run isn't directly comparable, but you can see the shape of the curve doesn't really change all that much. If boost was identical, we think power would have been as well. The six throttle had a little bit more boost in some parts of the rev range, but they are as close as we can get. And at peak power are within 0.2 PSI, with the six throttle actually having a little bit more. Yet, the single throttle setup makes more power basically everywhere. With more RPM, the more gap in power. On this boost and power level, the single throttle inlet makes 28 kilowatts or 38 horsepower more, and not just at peak power either. There is a chunk of extra power and torque in the last couple thousand RPM of the rev range. Considering this is where the car lives when drag racing, the extra power is certainly usable. There is also no loss of bottom end or mid range either, something many predicted would happen. So on the dyno, the single throttle inlet certainly wins the power part of our test. The real question now is what is the off boost and transient response like on the road? And how much does drive by wire change the feel of driving? There's only one way to find out. All right, time for the drivability test. Now there's two parts to this. There is the drivability when you're just cruising around normally, uh, and then there's the drivability, I guess, in performance application. So on track, roll racing, etc. Obviously in Sydney traffic, the normal drivability part is pretty much all we can show here is because, uh, well, it's pretty hard to let a car like this loose in suburban Sydney. So let's go for a drive, shall we? As you can see, we can get up 
up and moving in traffic without too much of a problem. So you're not scared of pulling out into traffic in the car. He's just a complete dud, laggy and goes nowhere. With the 3.2 litre, this car does get moving. And it did with six throttle and it does with single throttle. But so far, my driving experience on the road, the only real difference I pick up on is that having one big throttle body means that when you go just a tiny bit of throttle, the amount of opening that it creates in the throttle body is quite a lot. So it is very hard to get these big throttle bodies to be smooth as they initially open. That's one area where the six throttle does seem to do a little bit better. But we really are, well, we really are getting quite picky here. And it also has a lot to do with how you drive it as well. I'm still getting used to this setup. It's probably a big thing. So as you get more and more used to the setup, you do get better and better at driving it. Driving back streets. Car drives great. I um I, honestly I can't really pick it from six throttle to single throttle driving normally around back streets like this. Like I said, the only really thing I can really pick up on is just having one big large throttle body. It's just that initial throttle opening is a little bit different. sequential is how it gets on to boost only really matters in that initial roll on because once you're moving you've got the sequential so let's try and get you sort of like three and a half grand in second we'll hold that sort of steady three and a half grand in second gear and stand on it than the six throttle did. Man, it's hard to pick it on the bum dyno. You really have to get into some pretty serious data. And then it would be very hard to replicate the exact same thing every time. But So we're at 4,500 in third gear. I'm in vacuum. I'm going to stand on it. I don't know what else to tell you guys. when driving it on the street like this. I, I can't pick any difference in how long it takes to get onto boost when I stand on it. Obviously with this much traffic, that's about all we can do. We're not really looking at power and things like that. Obviously in this traffic, there's not much we can do, but all I wanted to see was, is when I stand on it above the boost threshold, so at 4,500 RPM, if I stand on it, how long did it take to go from complete vacuum to full boost and well, not very long at all, did it? So I can't see that being any slower than the six throttle. And if it is, we'll be getting down into millisecond stuff within data, uh, which I just don't have as it's so hard to replicate that exactly. But so in summary, for me, I can't really sense a whole lot of drivability difference with the single throttle versus the six throttle, other than maybe just that initial tiny light throttle opening, um, the six throttle is a little bit smoother. But we're talking about a big setup car here. We're not talking about a 500 horsepower GDR. We're talking about 1,050 to 1,100 with big cams and port work and that sort of stuff. So if you know what these cars are like, you know what they drive like anyway, but you're watching me successfully drive it in pretty heavy traffic without too much of an issue. So that already speaks for itself in what the drivability is like. But I'm sorry guys, but I'm not finding any disadvantages to switching over to this single throttle. I've got a better looking engine bay. I got rid of all the idle stepper motors and everything. I've got all the different uh, engine control strategies that the single throttle offers, such as better engine protection, better launch control, better flat shift, cruise control. All of the features that that single throttle gives me is very much worth it. The only question left to answer now is, I guess, what's it like on track? And I don't mean circuit because, well, this car ain't for circuit. We all know that. What's it like at roll racing? What's it like um, at power cruise and things like that? Because at the drag strip, it's all wide open throttle. So all of the advantages are there. There's no disadvantages. So all we've got left to test is what it's like at roll racing. Now, if we can get 
uh, some good weather this week, we'll head to roll racing, but it's just been raining all the time in Sydney. So if we get to roll racing, we'll get some more data of that. If we don't get to roll racing, I'll show you guys a little bit more, or well, just some raw driving so you can see what it drives like. ridiculously loud it is with the flapper valve open. just go and stuff it level four wheel spin because the track was quite slippery so it doesn't usually wheel spin that much in first but there was all that uh what's the name all the cleanup stuff on the track but um yeah once it got going it was fine so i'm gonna look at the logs now and just double check what's going on say hi to the camera though con Wait, what camera? there's a camera filming you do this <laughs> car in terms of having to actually pedal it quite a fair bit. That was, that was, that was, that was wild. That was good. Wow. So I checked over the logs after that second run on full power. Um, yeah, had 32 PSI up top, so that would have been the full probably 1,090 horsepower in top gear. Uh, has more boost in second now because Con turned it up. AFRs look good. EGTs look good, everything look good. Con said, mate, go enjoy the car. So I've lined up for eliminations. Normally I'd live stream eliminations here, but you know what? Let's see what happens first round. You never know who you're gonna get either. whole lot of fun but it goes dead straight it's not scary to drive like some other big cars are which I'm really happy about I really want to drive ability to be important but overall six throttle versus single throttle could I tell any difference tonight mate you could see me riding the clutch to take off and I had no problems whatsoever so uh well there you have it six throttle versus single throttle and our R32 Skyline GTR I think all of the tests pretty much spoke for themselves. We made more power up top, we didn't lose anything down low, we didn't lose any drivability, and the car performs just as good on the street and on the racetrack as it ever has. So overall, single throttle wins in this application. Now what's my conclusion overall? Well, I always used to actually say to people, if you make under a thousand horsepower, stick with six throttle, don't go to single throttle drive by wire unless you make over a thousand. And I'm pretty much gonna stick by that. My personal opinion is if you make 900 or less, stick to the factory six throttle or go to a Nismo inlet if you can, because the drivability with the Nismo inlet manifold on a medium frame turbo like the G35 was unbelievable. That combo was fantastic. The moment you turbocharge, it kind of goes into that over 70 millimeters in size. You know, if you start thinking 76, 75, 76, 85, uh, G40, G45, and you start looking to make a thousand plus, 
that's when you want to switch over to single throttle drive-by-wire. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't make power with six throttle. Plenty of guys has. We've just shown you that if you're doing a build from scratch and you want the optimum setup, single throttle drive-by-wire is the way to go. Not just for power, but obviously for all the other things that drive-by-wire gives you and a nice, neat engine bay. Because we will admit, our engine bay looks so much better now after all the work that CID did and the Hypertune inlet on it. The gray area is kind of between 900 and 1,000 horsepower. Should you switch or shouldn't you switch? Neither here nor there. Um, and the other argument that's going to pop up is what if it's an RB26 bottom end? What if it's a 2.6 or a 2.8? Will that affect it? My attitude is that if you are trying to make a 1,000 plus on a 2.6 or a 2.8 litre engine, the amount of boost that you're going to throw through it means that the flow of the inlet manifold actually becomes more important. So. I still stand by what I said of when you should switch and potentially you might even switch to drive-by-wire single throttle even earlier if you have a 2.6 or a 2.8, which probably goes against what a lot of people think. But for me, obviously the extra boost pressure that you need with smaller capacity means that the flow needs to be better to be more efficient anyway. So there you have it, 800 and below, stock. Uh, or go to a Nismo six throttle. If you are in that gray area, sort of 800 to 1,000, you can make the call, 1,000 plus single throttle drive-by-wire. There you have it. Some people are gonna love this, some people are gonna hate this, but guess what? The facts are the facts. So make sure you subscribe, because there's a whole lot more tests we still wanna do with GTRs in the future.